and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get the news and top selling games from October 1989. I get my hands on a Timex 2048. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with some remakes. But first, here's the news. Hot on the heels of Tubin and Hard Driving, Tenjin are about to release Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters. This 3D isometric game will certainly be a challenge for developers. Looking at the arcade version would suggest it's almost impossible on the spectrum. If you're stuck in an adventure game or RPG game and have money to burn, you can turn to a new company set up just to help you out. Inner Action has been set up by former magazine writers and columnists in a bid to help those that are tearing their hair out and have nowhere to turn. They do this by offering to take £5 of your money in exchange for assistance, or you could write to a magazine for help and wait for someone else to help you without having to pay. The choice is yours. Level 9, those brilliant adventure producers who've been around for years have finally called today with their last release. Skate Ghost will be their final title, after giving the adventure world classics like Night Arc, Colossal Adventure, Snowball and Time and Magic. It seems people don't want to play adventures anymore, and even their attempt to save themselves by joining up with Telecomsoft failed to ignite the market. A sad farewell. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. At number 5 is Kenny Dalglish Soccer by Cognito. At number 4, Batman by Ocean. At number 3, Crazy Cars 2 by Ocean. At number 2, Robocop by Ocean. And number 1, The Last Crusade by US Gold. And that was the news and top selling games from October 1989. There were many Spectrum clones in many countries across the world, and I covered an unofficial Brazilian machine, the TK90, and the TK95 in episode 52. They were, though, official clones as well, made in places like America, with the Timex 2068, and Portugal and Poland having the Timex 2048. And here is the Portuguese version, released in 1984. This was based on the unreleased American 16K version of the Spectrum, also called the Timex 2048. This, though, is probably one of the most compatible clones for its time, and it was about 90% compatible with software, but sadly not all hardware. There were a few things in the ROM that could potentially break games, sadly. The machine looks almost, but not quite like, the original 48K model. And the differences are not just skin deep, either. But let's start with the looks, though. It comes in a nice beige box. Simple design, with the slogan, Simple, versatile, affordable technology. There was also a picture of the Timex disk drive unit to entice buyers to get faster storage than the traditional tapes. The computer itself is cased in black plastic, with a nice grill effect along the top. The keys are white, and not made of rubber like its British counterpart. Instead they're hard plastic, taken from an electronic typewriter, and to be honest they feel much better. Because they're hard plastic, when the keys hit the bottom of their travel, you get a nice click, and of course you get a much better tactile experience. The legends are printed on the keys, but are not coloured like the original, so everything is black and white. The only exception are the colours at the top of the number keys. There's a full-size spacebar too, a great inclusion. On the back, there's the usual power socket, expansion slot, ear and mic sockets, and a TV output, but also a composite video socket, another great addition. On the left-hand side is a Kempston-compatible joystick, again another nice addition, and on the right, a power switch. Internally though, there are a few differences. There's new ULA chip providing additional graphics modes, and a larger speaker giving decent sound output. The new graphics modes are 256x192 with 15 colours, and 512x192 with 2 colours, in other words, monochrome. There are not many titles that use these modes though, so finding anything to demonstrate is a bit tricky. 
You can also get 80 column basic using an out command, which is nice, but these extra features have hardly been exploited. The machine comes with a demonstration tape that I hoped would be like Horizons. Sadly, it felt a little dull, to be honest. It covered the same material, the components of the hardware, keyboard training, how to get extended mode, and things like that. I went back and had a look at Horizons, and yes, it's just as dull, to be honest. It's something you would go through once when you first bought the computer, but never touch again. Maybe it would have been better if I understood Portuguese. Also, there was no included games either, so no Through the Wall or Monte Carlo. Right, let's set this up and have a play. The first thing that hits you is, of course, the keyboard. It feels really nice to use. Solid, good action, and great keys. The spacebar is an excellent addition, and really nice when you're writing basic or just typing. I tried to use my Spark card on this device, but it wasn't happy at all. I then tried my Divide E. That didn't crash the machine and allowed me to select games, but they never managed to load properly. My only option, therefore, was to use a TZX Duino to load the tape images in real time. Games are loaded in the normal manner, and after testing a few, I didn't find any that failed. The compatibility then was as good as it was claimed. However, I then tried Night Law, and although it loaded, as you can see, it isn't really playable. I then decided to try a newer game, El Stompo, that uses the Nirvana multicolour engine, and this didn't work either. The troubles don't stop there. The Kempston joystick port also has problems, and this is by design. Due to it being wired differently, some auto-firing joysticks fail to work. Continuing with the problems, and the expansion socket has a missing line, making some peripherals to just fail, which is probably why the smart card didn't work. Back to games then, and the speaker does a decent job, much louder than the original 48k model, and those keys really do make playing games easier. Alien 8 worked fine, no problems at all. Which was a bit strange, because Nightlaw didn't. Manic Miner, no problems again with either the music or the gameplay. Jetpack, who couldn't see this game coming? All feels and plays just as it should. I then decided to try Aquaplane to see if the border effect would work. And it did, no problems there either. I tried many more games, and all of them seemed to work great. There are, though, known games that fail, and these include Airwolf, Top Gun, Arkanoid, and Abu Simbel. Now on to the extra resolutions. High colour mode can be seen here in this demo, and yes, it looks good, and you can see better in this tile demo how the colours can be used. There is hardly anything that uses the high-res monochrome mode. There's a snake game that crashed for me, and an art package, and that's about it. This art package called Studio allowed you to draw in this mode, and it works quite well, I suppose, but again, it feels like it's all alone, with no one paying attention to it. And I wondered what modern developers could have done with these extra modes. The machine came with this compilation, and I can't find any mention of it anywhere on the internet. Loading the two games up, Using a real tape player, we see that Animated Strip Poker is from Nightsoft, but Will Series Baseball failed to work, but I presume it's the one by Imagine. Overall, this is an excellent little machine, if you can put up with a few games that don't load and the hardware problems. Luckily, being from Portugal, the power supply just needs a two-pin adapter, and that's all. It looks nice, it has a brilliant keyboard, sadly the high resolutions have not been used much, and it's a pity my smart card didn't work but it is compatible with Interface 1, although I didn't try it. I think two failed interfaces was pushing my luck. This is Spiky Harold, released by Firebird Software in 1986, and I'd first like to say that I've grown to hate this game. Anyway, 
You play Spiky, a hedgehog, that is preparing for hibernation and has to collect 57 items of food and then get back to his hibernation room. Yes, it's a platform game and to be honest, it looks really nice, but getting past this first room is impossible. It's so hard. The jump has to be pixel perfect, and I mean absolutely pixel perfect. Eventually though I got lucky and could explore some more. Harold moves well but the jump is a little odd and it's something you have to get used to. There's a sort of pause for about half a second while the crouch animation plays before jumping and it's difficult to get your timings right with this. Moving around it's a case of working out the enemy patterns and then navigating the rooms to avoid them. Although that's not as easy as it sounds and can be very frustrating as the jumps have to be very precise. The graphics are nice as you can see with some excellent textured backdrops and decent sprites. Harold himself does flicker badly though. As you move around you'll find things to eat. Sometimes it's a food item, sometimes it has strange effects like reversing the controls. The collision detection and spacing of the enemy sprites make this one of the most frustrating games I've played in a long time. Oh, dead again. There are places you know you have to get through, but you just can't. And some of these times you have no alternative route either, so you just have to keep losing your lives and start again. The game could have been so much better had it been a little easier, with more space to jump and less restrictive collision detection. Sound is terrible. An ear grating version of Flight of the Bumblebee plays throughout and it drives you bonkers. Well, I couldn't find a way of turning it off either. And this just added to the annoyance. Why was this game made so difficult? It just ruins what could have been a decent platformer. But in the end, you just want to throw it out of the window. At least it only cost $1.99. But still, I would have felt robbed had I bought this back then, even at that price. How the hell do you get past this bit? Dead again. Dead. And again, I mean, what fun this is. This is certainly no Sonic. was a classic arcade shoot-em-up released by Capcom in 1984. It was set, as the title suggests, in 1942 during World War II and sees you piloting a fighter plane trying to get to Tokyo to destroy their fleet. It's the usual shooting fest with great graphics and action and as an added feature your plane can perform a vertical loop to get you out of trouble. I like to play this whenever I see a cab at retro events but it's usually quite busy. In 1986, Elite managed to grab the license and release the Spectrum version, and here it is. As you would expect, the game has been cut back a little. There's no background graphics, for example, which at times makes the screen look empty. The sprites are bland, but do move okay. And talking of movement, the game just feels so slow compared to the arcade machine. After playing the arcade version for about 30 minutes and then moving over to this one it feels like you're playing in slow motion and the bad collision detection makes it tricky to make progress. The enemy patterns work well and there are the power ups like the arcade improving your firepower but without the colourful imagery and more importantly the speed the game seems incomplete. Sound is terrible really when you consider the license on offer here. Just a few blips and an awful tune that plays when your game continues after losing a life. If you can get far enough there's a carrier to land on and then it's back to the action after the same old tune again. Control is fine but to perform the role you have to use the keyboard even if you are using the joystick for the main movement and firing. 
Taking the game on its own merits, it's a nice little shooter if you can get over the collision detection. There's a variety of landscapes, although they do seem to repeat a lot, with the same islands appearing all the time throughout all the levels, and the enemy planes look the same throughout the game. Some landscapes turn green later on, but the game just seems incomplete, like I said before, and the sound is a major issue, and there's no getting away from it. There isn't even an explosion sound. The right hand panel looks terrible. It's there to reduce the width of the screen to make it more like the arcade aspect ratio, but it's bright yellow for no apparent reason. Well, to sum up then, a nice shooter, but a waste of a license. There are so many new games that I thought I would give you a quick roundup of things that we may have missed. First up is Droid Buster from Ariel and Ares. I think I said that right. A nice looking and good sounding maze game. is Sophia 2 by Alexandra Grusso. Another good looking and sounding game. Next is Booty the Remake, a modern remake of the Firebird classic by Salva Cantero. It's Ticka Taka. It's a 3D remake of Ultimate Play the Game's Attic Attack by Climacus. And lastly is Come ML Chip, a nice puzzle game similar to Chip's Challenge by Bikersoft. So today we're going to have a look through Your Sinclair, issue 13 from January 1987. It's an older one than we did last time. We it's did an eight, earlier. We did eight, 84, didn't we? Yeah, eight, yeah, it's a later one. We did 84 last time, didn't we? Yeah, we did do 84 last time. And it was Crash last time. So it was. And completely it, different. Looking, and the, the cover art is different to Crash again. Interesting. I'm not quite sure they've got the man right. You obviously know what it is. It's, it's Space Harrier. It's Space Harrier. But I'm not sure about that. I mean, Joss Sinclair have got better covers. Yeah, it's, it's not a Crash cover, is it? It's not an Ollie Frey cover. <laughs> if that no, was but... an Ollie Frey cover, there'd be tons of detail in the background and all kinds yeah. of stuff. Yeah, there? all, all yeah. airbrushed and everything. Apparently, this is the Christmas special because the the January edition came out in December. Straight into an advert for Gremlin Games. The only what? one of those games that I remember playing that I really liked was Avenger. Me too. I don't remember any of the others. I wouldn't have played Footballer of the Year because I don't like that sort of thing, but Avenger, yeah. Football is one of those games. You know, I think that the 8-bit computers couldn't really do 3D races. I don't think they could do football games that well. Even Match Day and Match Day 2, which were really, really good, were a bit kind of slow mm. and clunky, especially when you compare them to later ones. Contents. What strikes us in this? The lady with uh, on, on top of a pile of presents. Ah, I was. I thought you meant the lady being strangled. <laughs> well, that's rather odd. Looks like Maureen Lipman. Two previews of really good games, Space Harrier and Star Glider. 3D games don't get on with them, as mentioned with Starion last time. Uh, but the uh, I did get the Amiga version, and it had some really good music on the Amiga version, but we're not talking about that now. Space mm. Harrier, 
yeah, um, I will be reviewing... I have reviewed Space Harrier 2, so I don't know. I'll have to mix that in. Space Harrier by Elite was an okay game. Space Harrier 2 was handed over to a different company. Space Harrier was pretty good, actually. I remember playing Space Harrier and quite liking it. Hits in one hit pack, four massive hits in one hit pack. They'd started doing the... Let's package up all the old games and put them out as a compilation. Yeah. Well, Commando's a good game. Airwolf, I don't like. Bomb Jack, you like that, don't you? I love, the, love Bomb Jack. And Frank Baruna's boxing is... It was good for its time. It was obviously a uh, a knockout clone. Yeah. Um, I, st- I still like Frank Bruno's boxing. It was an unofficial punch, not knockout, punch out clone. Punch out, yeah. Could this be your program? A, a big question mark. Yes, you. it could be. Yes, my program. That is my new program, a question mark. <laughs> I'm mine. <laughs> is that the... That's the Max desktop. That's I think that's missing in action. There was, there was a couple of desktop like systems. There was one that came with a Kempston mouse and that's missing in action. That'd be really interesting to see. Um, and it obviously worked with microdrives, which that one does, but I don't, that one's by Max Desktop, isn't it? That's it. You can obviously see it better than not, I can. Oh, you can't read it? Okay. No. <laughs> that's going to be tricky to talk about things. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I used to do quite often with magazines and just look at the pictures. <laughs> Gauntlet. Future, Gauntlet Future was a Shocks. good game. Gauntlet was a good game. Um, it was converted very well. It's really good to play. But obviously, they had to cut down on the floor textures and voice samples and stuff, but it's still a, a decent game. It is. It was a really, really good game. I was the fun playing that. It's a pity you had to load every single level from tape. Mm. But... Ooh, top 20. Oh, so what's in the top? Paperboy. Paperboy, Paperboy. It wasn't bad on the Spectrum. Is that it? the re-release? Or the... It wasn't released then, was it? It was released quite late in the Spectrum's life. Okay, Light Force. Good shoot em up. 1942, good shoot 'em up. Ollie and Lisa meh, wasn't impressed. Dragon's Lair, yeah, the software projects tried to convert the arcade laser disc game to the Spectrum. I bought uh, it. And what did you think? Um, it was very frustrating, but then again, <laughs> so was the uh, original arcade game. So That's true. That's it true. was true, true to life. <laughs> hey, have you seen who the Desert Island Discs is? Who is it? Joffa Smith. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. His top ten, Luna Jetman. Great game. Galaxians, great game. Kong, not so good. Commando, ping I like pong. Kong. I like Ocean Kong. I know. Yeah. Match Day, Chucky Egg, and Ghosts and Goblins. That's, that's some not good ten, games in there. Advert for some soundy thing. Advert for some soundy thing. It's a RAM music machine. That's what I said. Some soundy <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's a sound bite. Game maps in magazines were a mixed bag. Sometimes they were really badly hand-drawn things that you couldn't make any head and tail of. And some of them, even though they were hand-drawn, were very, very good. And the um, anterior map looks looks hand-drawn, but it looks very good, doesn't it? It does look pretty good. Somebody spent a lot of time mapping all the rooms and what everything does. And um, yeah, uh, Right, Simply Red. Was Simply, Simply Red a game? No, Simply Red is a hardware add-on that it's a bit like Amazon's Alexa, except you can't talk to it, and you plug it into various things, and your Spectrum can control bits of your house. That sounds cool. Actually. It's. I've never. I've seen one photograph of one, but I've never actually seen one in in the flesh, as it were. I've never seen. Don't know anybody that's got one. It'd be interesting to play though. Play with yeah, though. You plug pretty. it in and you, you can con- you turn. You think it just turns electrical sockets on and off and that sort of thing, so you can lights and things. Like Alexa can do. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Spectrum was doing it way before that. Well, there you go. But with cables. What's, oh, we've got add-ons for the Spectrum. Oh, it's the Complement, which was uh, a package that had... It wasn't actually a Complement. It was a Discovery, Opus Discovery disk drive with a Saga keyboard and a printer. And then I think Saga put it all together and called it a Complement. Where's the Spectrum? Where's the hiding inside, the inside the keyboard. Uh, that and, looks a bit cumbersome. That, that looks like if you type on it, it's going to like go rocking all over the place yeah, and everything's going to re- Really good keyboard, that Saga. I had one of those. Really good. Wish I hadn't thrown it away. Adventure columns. They were, they were an interesting thing. You either skipped over them because you had no interest or you, you read them and that was a favourite part of your magazine if you were into mm. adventures. I quite liked adventures. I didn't get on with them that well. Some were good. I always used to read the Tony Bridges um, adventure a column in Popular Computing Weekly, and I also got Micro Adventure magazine as well. Oh, oh the, 
it's the, the it's the teletext adapter lets you plug your spectrum into a tv aerial and get cfax and oracle and that sort of thing did that work were there enough lines on the spectrum uh, apparently so. <laughs> I've never seen one in action, and obviously it's a pity you can't get them now because they shut down all those services, haven't they? Yeah. Top Gun advert. So the, yep, back page Top Gun advert, and that is a subject we will be covering in a later Let's Talk. Not Top Gun, obviously, but games with uh, games for movies, movies with games. To, <laughs> we're going to have to work out some games to just try and play before we, um, <laughs> yes. we do that. Otherwise, that is a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is Labyrinth, released by Axis Software in 1983. This was one of the first games that I bought, along with Gobbleman from Arctic Computing, and the cover intrigued me. The inlay boasted a full 3D colour maze that you wandered around in, just as if you were there. Once into the game, and we are shown some brief instructions, before being asked how wide and high we want the maze to be. The maze is then randomly generated, and you are shown a top-down view of it. Here you can plan your moves. Once we get into the maze itself, we get a 3D view. Using the cursor keys to rotate and move, you walk along in blocks trying to get out. If you get lost, you can ask for help, and here you're shown the map view again for a few seconds, and then allowed to carry on. You have a limited number of steps to escape though, so a good memory is required for larger mazes. If you manage to get to the exit, you can see the steps that you took to get out. Yes, it's a maze game. The 3D view is okay and works well, and the option to set the maze size and see the route you took are good ideas and mean that you can tailor the level of play as required. When I first got this, I wasn't too happy, but being one of only two games I had, I gave it some time. Not as much as Gobbleman, but it still holds early memories for me. Taking that away though, and it's a simple maze game without any frills. For those interested, yes, you can break into it, and view the mostly basic code. There is one cave machine code though, I presume for drawing the maze itself. One for maze fans only then. Time to look at some remakes. Back in the early 2000s there were a lot of remakes coming out, and this continued for a few years with some really excellent titles being released. This one is Jetpack Solar Crisis, released by Richard Jordan in 2004. This just isn't a clone of the original though, it goes further and introduces new elements. Not only do you have to build and fuel a spaceship, but also fuel your own ship. the usual bonus items and some special items too. A shield that will give you invulnerability for a while, a mushroom that makes things go all weird and odd things appear on screen, and my favourite, a little spectrum. When you collect that, a spectrum game character appears and walks across the bottom of the screen. There are the usual aliens to shoot and these are varied and interesting. The graphics are brilliant, and the sound is really well used. There are different levels too, and great playability. You can play the game full screen, or in windowed mode, and overall this is an excellent game, and well worth getting, especially if you're a fan of the original like myself. The next one is Chucky Egg, The New Batch by John Blythe, released in 2003. Oh. 
obviously the graphics have been updated and there's a nice Amiga demo tune playing throughout. It can be turned off if you want, but I quite like this. The platform layout is the same as the original, which means it's familiar, and there's some nice sound effects too. You can change the game speed if it's a little slow or fast for you, which is a good idea, and the control is good overall, but the jumps can be a bit tricky to get right. This is a great remake then, and one to play even if you didn't like the original. <laughs>